today will be our last day of new material. We're going to be going through, we'll start with this in our groups. So in a moment, I'll kind of cut you loose to get going on this. Um, if you want to title today, today is going to be combinations, permutations, and what's called the binomial theorem. And we'll wrap everything up with what's called the birthday problem. Um, and throughout the time, um, I'll, I'll be jumping in and saying, the, as far as how might this look as an exam type question, what to be looking for, for that kind of thing too. Um, in preparation for the exam, remember our exam is a week from today. So that'd be Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. We'll be in this room. Please have your own calculators. You're going to need one for the entire test. Um, you can bring with you a single sheet of paper with anything written on it you want written on it, not typed out, not printed off. Um, so if you want to have on there some generic formulas like the quadratic formula, um, have something on there um, like what we've done for doing... Actually, you can have example problems if you wish, something to give you inspiration on how to work through certain types of problems. Um, anything from, oh gosh, think of all the other past exams we've had. Um, synthetic division, an example problem for how to do that. An example problem from doing rates, um, how to convert logarithms to exponents. You know, Pretty much go through our book, look at all the topics and think, what could I be doing there? If you look at your last, right before the last part of every chapter, there's a summation for a lot of the content. Um, and that's a good place to start to, to jog your memory for all the things that are going on um, and that we've covered throughout the course of this semester. Um, yes, the exam is cumulative, so it'll include stuff from exam one and exam two and then everything since exam two. There will be a little bit more emphasis on the things since exam two. So there'll be a few more, the higher percentage of the problems are going to be since then. Um, I anticipate it taking you at least an hour and a half of the two-hour time slot, but you have the full, full two hours to go to finish the test up. Um, uh, this is our last day of new content, so anything after this. So then on Thursday when we meet, it will be um, all of a few review questions, but not much. I've given out like uh, online. There's been that review quiz that you can take repeatedly until you get a score that you like. Um, there are still several people who have not yet ever taken it once. Um, if you notice that, it turned into a zero on December 1st, but you can still go and do it and still replace that grade with something else and keep retaking that until you get a grade that's sufficient. Um, but that's good review for what we're doing in class in preparation for the exam. Uh, but then looking at all the check your understanding problems that we've done as well and coming with some questions to ask on Thursday so that way you know that you are getting your questions asked. Uh, in preparation for the exam. It definitely helps to then think of like as them as individual people, but notice too also, A, B is, you know, B, A is not a different group because a group is just, you know, you just pick a group. You're in groups right now. Did it matter the order that you were picked? No. If you're just in a group, order didn't matter. So you're just picking up a group. So as far as three people, then that's, sorry, yeah, three people in a room, groups of two. That's how we did it. Start setting up a process for discerning four and five. By the time you get to six, it's going to be a little bit extra work. Yes, I know. Um, but then what are we looking for? Because math is the study of patterns. You're looking for a pattern. How do we go from this to this to this to this to see if we can come up with a generalized way of finding it for all any numbers for n, for groups of two. Um, and then actually what we'll do from there is we'll actually develop a formula for no matter how many people are in the room and however my group size is. So keep plugging away on those. So then lastly, for six people, what was the number? 15. <clears throat> Do we see a pattern developing anywhere in this process? So again, as long as you, I mean, the, the more organized you were in trying to come up with setting this up, so A, first one times the second, first and second, first and third, first and fourth, or here, like we just did, A, B, A, C, A, D, A, E, that was four, B, C, B, D, B, E, that's three. C, D, C, E, 2, and then D, E, 1, 4, 3, 2, 1. That was the 10. 15, similar process. 
So either you're looking at these for patterns or you're looking at these. So let's put this one in order here. So when we had three people, we had three. So three, six, 10, 15. What's happening? Do we notice any patterns developing? Or can I come up with the overall, like what if I just have N? Or what if we said, what if we said there were 15 people in the room? Let me change the color on that back to white to be consistent with the other ones. So what if we had 15 people? Is there a way that I could look at this and quickly get to an answer, either through a formula or a process? Any patterns that we notice here or here? Say again? Okay, so here we had five people. So it was four, three, two, one. When I had four people, it was three, two, one. Three in terms of three started with the first person, then two started with the second person, then one started with the third with the third person. So if we had 15 people, you'd say we'd have 14 plus 13 plus 12 comma, plus all the way down to one. <coughs> and that would be the correct answer. Yeah, that's one way to get there super fast. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever looked at an arith, this is what's called an arithmetic series. If you want to add that up really quick, usually the easiest way to go is look at the first and last term. 14 plus one is 15. What's the next number? 2. 13 plus 2 is 15. 3 was the next one up. 12 and 3 is 15. And then you got to think through how many pairs of 15 do I have? So that'd be a faster way than just going to your calculator. 14 plus 13 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus. That just takes you a long time to go. All right. So within this pattern, there's going to be a formula that we're going to develop, not right now on this slide, but in a future slide here this morning. Um, but this is, these are what are called combinations. Which, unfortunately, the English language has messed us up in terms of thinking about what combinations are. Because if you've got a bike lock or you've got... So, you know, back when you had a locker in school and you had that thing with the lock on it and you had to enter something into it in order for it to open, what did you call that, those series of numbers that you put in there? Combination. combination. Unfortunately, a combination mathematically, order doesn't matter. So in this case, these are all combinations of size two because we're picking pairs. But we could do all sorts of things. If I want to say, if I have a group of six people, how many groups of three could I have? Again, the group, it doesn't order the matter. They would be called what are mathematically combinations. So a combination is one where there's a series of things that you're selecting. And I really don't care the order. I just want to pick three. All right. When order is important, we call it something else. So now if we go like this, how many different ways can four people finish first, second, and third in a race? And then five people, six people, seven people, eight people, and then N people. So this is your next task. See if you can start with this one. So if I have four people, if you want, we can work that one together. I want four people that are going to finish a race in first, second, and third place. So if I have people A, B, C, and D, Now, obviously, if I have, well, let's go the other way. Let's actually start with three. Let's start with three people. If I have three people, how many ways can they finish first, second, and third? Because first place is different than second. So ABC is one. ACB is one. BAC. BCA. 
CAB, CBA. And I believe those would be the only ones. For a total of six ways. One, two, three, four, five, six ways. There are six ways that three people could be. How about four people? So why don't you together in your groups figure out four people and five people. If you find a pattern, you'll realize how quick it is to get to six, seven, and eight, but we'll just start with these and then we'll come back together. So as we showed on the board, the, uh, so what do we have? How many ways are there for A to finish first? Six ways for A to finish first. How many ways for B to finish first? Six ways. You think that process is going to hold out? Okay. So how many sets of six will there be? Four. So for a grand total of 24. These numbers are going to go up a lot bigger. Five. How many do you think there will be? It's 120. Yep. Nope. How'd you get that? Yep, so this would be times five. How do we go from here to here? Times four. And if I had, well, two people finishing for a second and third, I can't because there's only two people. So if we wanted to go to six, it'd be that times six. There are 720 ways for six people. If I have a group of six people to finish for second and third place, keep going up by one as we're multiplying more by one, more by one, more by one. So this one actually, so this, the last ones were called combinations. This is called permutation. Permutations. So the difference is, in a permutation, the order matters. First, second, third place, that matters. In a combination, just picking a group, it doesn't matter the order you're picked, you're just in a group. But as soon as the order matters, now we have what's called a permutation. All right. So a permutation, as we're looking, we're going up and we're multiplying each time. So I'll sh let me see, is that my neck here quick? Um, so as you can see, if we keep going up, right, so 720 times seven, and then times eight, there are 40,320 different ways for eight people in a race to finish first, second, or third place. Which is a lot. Yeah. But those are what are called permutations but line mm, no we'll go pascal's triangle then we'll come back to the formulas so i'm going to show you pascal's triangle we'll develop this out we'll develop what's called the binomial theorem here in just a minute uh, but this is pascal's triangle And what it is, it's just a, a series of numbers that when you look at the numbers above it, so the two above it is the one and the one, the one and the one add to two. 
This three, the numbers above it, are the one and the two, and they add to three. Six, the three and the three add to six. Down here, the 20, the 10, and the 10. The five and the 10 add to the 15. So it's a way of organizing uh, a series of numbers. Again, where it's just the sum of the diagonal numbers above it coming down. And what we actually find is it's also the coefficients of a, a binomial expansion. What do I mean by binomial expansion? If I have x plus y to the n power. Right. So if I were to square this, x plus y squared, all right, we've done that, that's FOIL. That'd be x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. The coefficients are 1, 2, and 1, which is this row right here. If I were to take x plus y up here and cube it, I would have coefficients of 1, 3, that's kind of far over, I'm going to lose space there, 3, 3, and 1, and what it would be would be, it would be the x cubed, x squared y, xy squared, and then y cubed, and then we'll have plus in between them. If I do it to the fourth power, I would have then this row. It would be 1, because that's the 1 over here, x to the 4th, plus 4x cubed y, plus 6x squared y squared. See how the power is kind of, as one is going down, the other one's coming up, plus 4xy cubed. Hold on just a moment. Hello. Hello. Um, this is an Amazon delivery driver. Um, yes. I have a package for Brian, um, but it won't let me drop it off without a one-time password. Sometimes it does this. Um, do you just have the last two of your phone number? I could use that real quick. Um, 35. All right. Let me see. All right. We're good. All right. Thanks. Perfect. Yes, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. And then plus, or was I? And then one uh, y to the fourth. So that's Pascal's theorem. And then this is what's called the binomial expansion, um, which is related to combinations. Again, we're going to get there, and I'll do the formula here on the next slide. But Pascal's triangle has a lot of other fun qualities and characteristics that go with it. Um, in algebra, this is how it works for us here. But then finally, we're going to get to the actual formula for combinations and permutations. So let me just go ahead and write it here to start with, and then you'll say, oh, that's not a C, I want N C R, and it'll be N factorial over r factorial times n minus r factorial. I'll explain factorial in a minute. This is n p r is n factorial over n minus r factorial. All right. In both cases, n stands for number in the group or number in the room or total number, you know, like when we did the combination, it was the total number of people in the room. And R is my group size. Here, N is the number in the room, or in the example we did, we did, you know, how many were in the race. And R is the number uh, picked or the number of place finishers by the example that we did. <clears throat> so what that would mean from the examples that we worked on in class just a little bit ago was if we were to do 
Um, we had six people in the room, combination. How many groups of two are there? I would use this formula, and I would say six factorial divided by two factorial times six minus two factorial. And at this point, some of you have probably never seen the factorial before. Some of you may have. Factorial means six times five times four times three times two times one. In the denominator, I'm going to have two factorial, which is two times one. And then inside the parentheses there, I have six minus two. Well, six minus two is four. And four factorial is four times three times two times one. Some calculators have this in there. Some don't. But if you write it out, I can see that the ones reduce, the twos reduce, the threes reduce, the fours reduce. And this two will go into six three times for a total of 15 ways. Three times five. There were 15 ways to have a group of two if I had six people in my group, or six people in the room. There are 15 different groups of two. If I do it for a permutation, if I have six people in a race and I want to know how much are, how many are going to win or show, no, win or place, win, place, show, one or two, first or second place. Call it first and second place. To use the formula, it would be n factorial, which is 6 factorial, divided by 6 minus 2 factorial. So in the numerator, 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. In the denominator, 6 minus 2, well, that's 4. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Reduce, 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 reduce. 6 times 5, there are... 30 ways in a race with six people, there are 30 different ways to come in only first or second place. That's combinations and permutations. In permute or sorry, in combinations, we say order does not matter. In permutations, order does matter. So if you can remember it as combinations is just a group. Permutations is the, you know, like place finishers. Um, other examples from like practical, like, hey, if you have a group of this many people, um, how many different ways can you have president, vice president, secretary for if you're, you know, participating in something like uh, class officers, something along those lines. How many different ways you could have those people there? Combination and permutation. So if you take your standard quote unquote combination lock, right? You had a combination lock with the dial. How many numbers were on that dial? Do you remember? When you spun your little dial on your lock. Thirty-five. Could have been thirty-five. I've seen as many as thirty-nine. But if we say there's thirty-five numbers on there. And then how many numbers are in your combination lock when you've done it? Three. Usually three numbers. All right, you like spin it clockwise so you get to the number and then you go counterclockwise past the number to the next number and then clockwise back to the third. But that would be 35 permutation three, which would be 35 factorial over 35 minus three factorial, which is going to be 35 times 34 times 33 times 32. I'm going to run out of room, but that's on purpose. So it's times 32 factorial. But in the denominator, what do I have? I have 35 minus 33, which is 32. So in the denominator, I have 32 factorial. Those would reduce, and I just have 35 times 34 times 33, and that's the total number of different unique permutations that that lock can have. 
and it assumes you cannot repeat numbers. So in a permutation, if once one person or one thing is selected, it can't be selected again. So I don't know if on those combination locks, which are actually right, it should be called a permutation lock. I don't know if on a permutation lock, if you can actually have the same number repeat to do your to open up the lock. But if you can, then it's not this number. If numbers can repeat, then there are 35 choices for the first number, 35 choices for the second number, and 35 choices for the third number. So it would actually be a larger number if they could repeat. But in a permutation, we're going to assume they cannot repeat. So whatever that number is would be how many different ways you could go about opening up that lock. <clears throat> so how does this get used? So the combinations is going to be used in what's called the binomial theorem. I mentioned the binomial expansion. That was Pascal's triangle. The binomial theorem is the following. It is going to be P to the R power times 1 minus P to the N minus R power. And I didn't leave room for my thing out in front. Out in front should be N C R. So really it's N C R times P to the R times one minus P to the N minus R. So as an example, we're gonna do this thing in yellow. If I flip a coin 10 times, that's N. What's the probability that's P, that there are exactly five heads, that's R. So to do this formula up here, I do NCR, so N is 10, combination five, times P, what's the probability of getting a heads? Should be 0 0.5 if you flip a coin, 50-50 chance or one half, to the five power, because I want there to be exactly five heads. And then one minus P, well in this case it happens to be the exact same number 0.5, because if P is 0.5, then one minus P is also 0.5, because a heads and a tails. This is the probability of what we call success, having a heads, that's the probability of a failure being a tails. Success and failure are only determined by the context of the question. So we're talking about having exactly five heads. So heads is my success. That means tails is my failure. Make sure we see that this is minus, not times. Um, to the n minus r, which is 10 minus 5. As far as your final exam goes, that would be as much as I would expect you to set up and do but not to actually calculate it out. Because you probably don't have a calculator that can do that really well. <clears throat> because I don't believe the standard cell phone calculator does combinations and permutations. Um, but if you have a graphing calculator, it does, and the answer would be so if I do that, my final answer would be 0.246. So if you flip a coin 10 times, there's only about a 24.6% chance that exactly five of them are heads, which would make exactly five of them are tails. Some people don't like that because they think that, well, wait, shouldn't it be closer to 50-50? The more times you flip a coin there will be a distribution of how that thing could happen. Now, what's the probability that you would have only, let's say, if you flip a coin 10 times, what's the probability you only have, let's say, two heads? That comes out to only 4%. Right. So when you get to those tail ends, it starts to make a little bit more sense because if you flip a coin 10 times, you're going to have typically more than one or more than two. All right, But to have exactly five, is, is going to be that percent there. So in, as far as um, exam type related, uh, if it's binomial, and it would be similar to this idea down here, it would just be setting up your equation with the correct values in it. All right. 
Um, oh, probability of no heads. So if I did that, it would be 10 combination zero times 0.5 to the zero times 0.5 to the 10 minus zero. And if that's the case, this would be 10 factorial over zero factorial times 10 minus zero factorial. That's the equation for combinations. That would be 10 factorial over 10 factorial, which is one. There is only one way to have no heads at all. That would be all of them tails. It would end up being just 0.5 to the 10th power, which is pretty, 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 pretty unusual. All right, and then lastly, we have the birthday problem. So here's the scenario of the birthday problem. It's set up like this. If I have a room of, I don't know, pick a number. What's your average class size here at Simpson that you're in? Like how many people should be in the class? Not like how many people show up at an 8 a.m. class. 32 to 34. 32 to 34? Let's say 32. Let's say you have an average class size of 32 people. We're going to find the probability that nobody in that room has the same birthday. All right. Now, before we get going, what would you venture as a guess? What's the likelihood that nobody has the same birthday in a room of 32 people? Just go ahead and throw me out a couple of guesses of what you think would be a reasonable answer. If you have 32 people in a room, what's the likelihood that nobody has the same birthday? How much? 98%? That nobody has the same birthday? That means 2% like that almost guaranteed that someone has the same birthday. If there's 32 people in the room, you think there's a really, really high chance that at least two people have the same birthday? No. Because that's what this would say. This would say there's a really high chance. I meant like the opposite. Oh, like 2%. 98% higher than not. Oh, 90% sure there's not. Got it. I'm saying what's the probability that there is at least two people with the same birthday? So you're saying more like a 2%. Okay. How much? 5%. So pretty low probability is what we would theoretically think, right? All right. So here's where we start. The first person comes into the room. There's the first person that comes into the room. What is the probability that they have a different birthday than everybody else in the room? Well, they're the first person in the room. So as a probability, it's going to be 365 out of 365. Because you're the first person in the room, you are guaranteed to have a unique birthday. So there's a 100% chance if you're the one person in the room that your birthday is different than everybody else's. So then, second person in the room, what is the probability that their birthday is different than the other person in the room? Well, the other person in the room only picked one day. All right? So December 8th, that's mine. That's my birthday. So if someone else comes in and they have a different birthday... That meant there are 364 choices left out of 365. And probability is what you want out of how many possible. So the 365 will stay the same in my denominator. So now the third person comes into the room. How many birthday choices do they have? 363. And what we're doing here is kind of like what you started with when you said 98% is how many have different birthdays. So if we find the ways that they can all have different birthdays, whatever's left is that means someone has to have the same birthday. So if I can start by saying, well, how many, how many ways can I have it so they're all different birthdays? 365, that's a, times 364, times 363, times down to 365, minus 32 for that 32nd person that comes into the room. All over 365 to the 32nd power, because I'm doing it 32 times. This would be the probability 
that there are no birthdays the same. Birthdays the same equals zero, none. Well, this number in the top at first looks like that's a really hard number to calculate, but it's this 365. Oh, that's a terrible 365 permutation 32. It's a permutation because the order of the birthdays, right? We want them all to be different, all to be unique. So in that way, the order matters. Divided by 365 to the 32nd power. Now again, this becomes a large, large number that most calculators can't do. Mm. Where's my, oh. Math, PRB, MCR, 32. So this number in the numerator is 2.429 times 10 to the 81st power. It's a massively huge number. But I want to divide that by 365 to the 32nd power. So if I do that number divided by divided by uh, 365 to the 32nd power, I get 0.2466. And this is the probability that nobody in the room has the same birthday. So that's the, pro again, that's the probability that nobody in the room has the same birthday. So what is the likelihood that somebody has the same birthday? So the probability that nobody has the same birthday is 0.2466. So the probability that the birthday is greater than or equal to, so there's at least one person with the same birthday, would be one minus that number. Because you either have nobody with the same birthday or somebody has the same birthday. Which is 75.33%. So in a room of 32 people, there's about a three out of four chance or a 30 or a 75% chance that at least two people have the same birthday where we oftentimes get caught up thinking that can't be right. There's no way that's right. But the math doesn't lie um, is that it's possible that, yes, you could have only one person and one other person having the same birthday. Anybody else is different, but you could have all the other ways of at least two people having the same birthday. And what ends up happening when you have that at least aspect to it is you're saying, well, what if three people have the same birthday or two pairs of people have the same birthday or all sorts of other things that could happen. It's actually more unlikely that nobody has the same birthday than at least two people having the same birthday with only 32 people in the room. So that's the birthday problem. So what would happen uh, as we look towards the final exam? Where might this all show up? I already mentioned with the combinations is setting it up and identifying that this is a combination. This is the right formula to use and setting up the numbers in the formula um, would be sufficient for doing a question. If it's a birthday problem um, or something similar to that, it would be looking at, um, well, how many ways you start with? How many ways can it happen? 365, 364, 363, something along those lines. Um, the, the birthday problem itself is not going to be on the exam. That'd be a little bit too much to try to calculate out, especially by hand, uh, because you don't have an expectation of having to have a um, graphing calculator. Because unless you have, and sometimes even the older graphing calculators don't have enough memory to do numbers that big uh, in, their, in their function capacity. Um, but setting it up, permutation or combination, like is it a permutation, is it a combination, how do you know, which was the right formula to use, plugging in those numbers, 
And if you want to sketch it out by hand after that, you can, but you wouldn't have to. Um, but getting into this idea of more sophisticated counting techniques, basically, when you're looking at patterns of numbers and orders of numbers that go into different series. So then this lends itself to what you would see a little bit when you get to uh, pre-calc, if that's the next class that you're planning to take. Um, if you're stepping into statistics next, they'll spend some more time, uh, more time in pre-calc, sorry, stats will spend more time with this kind of material, combinations and permutations, than you would see if you go into pre-calc.